How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. As a listener of DNA Today, you've probably heard me talk about NIPT, non-invasive prenatal screening or testing that looks for extra or missing chromosome conditions during pregnancy. But did you know there's one that can also screen for recessive disorders like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, and fetal antigens? Billion to One offers Unity Screening, which does all of this from one blood draw from a pregnant person. Visit unityscreen.com for more information and stay tuned for our upcoming episodes with Billion to One, exploring non-invasive prenatal screening for recessive conditions and red blood cell fetal antigens. Pop quiz, what disorder causes an accumulation of copper in the body? That would be Wilson's disease. To dive deeper, I interviewed the CEO of Orphanlin, Nassim Amin. Nassim has spent years learning about Wilson's disease. One of the most surprising facts I learned from Nassim during the interview is that treatment for Wilson's disease was developed in the 50s, so that's about 70 years ago. It was really interesting to learn how Orphanlin's FDA-approved drug improves upon how this original drug works. It no longer needs to be refrigerated, and it can be taken less throughout the day. If you have a genetic counseling board exam coming up next month, I highly recommend this episode. It's an easy way to learn about Wilson's disease. I found it seemed to be really engaging and clear in his biochemical explanation, which is saying a lot because back in grad school, that's where I would typically get lost in lectures. This episode will drop next week to kick off Rare Disease Month, so keep your eye out for episode 222. To learn more about Wilson's disease and Orphanlin's impact, go to orphalin.com. Again, that's orphalin.com. In this episode, we're chatting about the genetic counseling field in South Africa. Joining me are two guests from the University of Cape Town. Samantha Bailey is a current student, and Tina Marie Vessels is a professor at UCT. Thank you both so much for coming on, especially with our time difference here. It's always interesting talking with other people around the globe. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having us. So one of my first questions I had when thinking about how different the field of genetic counseling is in Africa compared to where I practice in the United States is how it works in terms of genetic counselors either having specialties like prenatal, cancer, pediatrics, or if most people are more generalists. I don't know who wants to kick us off here. So I guess I can speak into a little bit of, we have working in states and working in privates and generally in states you can deal with anything and everything you don't really specialize and then if you're working in private then you can kind of specialize and more focus your referrals or focus if you work in a particular company or things that you can be more specialized interesting so it's really what type of job you have in terms of working like in the private sector versus like the state is what you're saying yeah yeah exactly so we have um exactly what sam was saying it's just that in the state the you have all these different clinics and everybody goes to all of them whereas in private you have the opportunity to um, focus on a specific area so there's typically a lot of cancer counselors and prenatal. Interesting. And, and what is usually like the wait list? If, is there a difference between private and state? I think so, yes. I'm not, um, I think the, the private counselors have more capacity to see, um, they have shorter waiting lists. We're in private, we probably book three months in advance, so we're full for the next three months, if I can say that, depending on which clinics. So yeah, if you look at our list, 
Yeah. yeah. So if you look at our list currently, we for some of the clinics we already fully booked till like May. Wow. So that's that, that's months in the future. Wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And and back in 2017, so about six years ago, I interviewed a genetic counselor in South Africa, um, Shelley McCauley, and she said out of nine South African provinces, five do not have genetic counseling services. Is this still the case six years later? Like, how is care in terms of access to genetic counselors in the different provinces? So um, pretty much still the same. So we have the nine provinces and basically in the two of them, in Cape, uh, well, Western Cape and Gauteng, we have comprehensive services. Um, and then in the other provinces, we have some genetics, some offered by pediatricians with nursing support. Um, some provinces only have private, some provinces have nothing. So it is a bit of a mix, but it hasn't really changed since 2017 when you interviewed Shelley. Um, I think the only thing is that one of the state doctors had retired. And in fact, that province now only has access to some private doctors. No counselors, though. And Tina, why do you think that is? I mean, what are the limiting factors when it comes to expanding how many genetic counselors there are and genetic professionals? Because there's other people performing genetic counseling, as you mentioned, like doctors. Yeah. What are those limiting factors, you think? It's mostly to do with political will um, that, you know, it's government funded posts and that we, you know, there's competition in terms of where funding goes. Does it go to pediatrics? Does it go to neonatology? Does it go to genetics? And genetics is a little bit lower down on the list. So there are not new posts created, which is where the problem comes in. And even in, but I think maybe to say a little bit that there is some progress in terms of before we didn't have a job description for a genetic counselor in the state service, we've at least got that in a salary scale attached. So it's now just to motivate and make sure that the different hospitals um, acknowledge that and create posts. So it's a step in the right direction in terms of just like being yeah. listed and, and just awareness yeah. there. Because yeah. then it, once you have awareness, it's much easier for other pieces to fall into yes, place exactly yeah what are some ways that you see you guys being able to raise awareness specifically in healthcare for genetic counselors and the services that you know us being genetic counselors that we can provide so that i mean obviously you have a lot of referrals so like that's not really the problem but just having more people that are working in the field what what are ways that you think would benefit and having that awareness there and, and also the funding? Mm. I mean, it's kind of a big question. Been, <laughs> it is a big question. <laughs> if we only, only need to have the answers, I think, um, you know, we've been motivating and they've been um, lobbying government and um, we have a policy guidelines book. So it's also the way that our government is structured. We've been thinking of getting counselors on the ground, like what we call a community service. So that's you know something that we have been thinking, maybe this is a route to go. But I don't know, maybe our new students have some better <laughs> ideas because what we've been doing have not been working very well. Yeah, sometimes a fresh perspective is good. Sam, is yeah. there anything to add on to what Tina was sharing with us? Well, I don't think Tina is wrong by any means. I think there's always that we just have to keep going, keep pursuing. But, I mean, I guess there are new ways to create awareness, like as we've seen with social media, and it was part of the reason why I kind of started a little Instagram page, because I think a lot of people, even if they know about genetic counseling, they might not know that it's actually available in South Africa. Um, so I think there are numerous ways that we're trying to get awareness, but how all of them work and how all of them actually come together towards posts and spreading across Africa is complicated and difficult to understand, I think. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. And, and, you know, as you said, one of the reasons you started your Instagram page. On your Instagram page, you share a lot about what the student experience is like. You have great videos of, like, this is kind of my day and starting out your day and walking to work. And so it's really cool to see, like, a day in the life of, you know, genetic counseling student in South Africa. 
Um, what's some other content that you share on there? What, what does a typical day look like for you being a student? Well, I think I try to share enlightening or somewhat funny content. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about like what we're doing. So the fact that we do, you know, telephonic counseling, and then we go to different kinds of clinics. So we do see cancer, we see prenatal, we see pediatric. So also showing that they're different things. And um, yeah, I guess just kind of showing some of the struggles and a little bit of insight into the student experience. It was something that when I was applying and looking at early counseling as a career, I didn't find all that much online, especially a few years ago, it was very limited. And I think recently it's gotten more and more popular. I think also as you just you find more people that you have this in common with. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of just a way of connecting with other GCs internationally. Yeah, because I mean, I personally don't follow any other genetic counseling student in South Africa. Maybe you could give me recommendations on, on who else to follow unless you're really the only one documenting uh, your experience. But yeah, there's certainly more people in the U.S. and Canada that I see kind of sharing their experience. Um, but in terms of my exposure, you, you would be it. So <laughs> thank you for just being able to share all that. Um, there's, from my understanding, there's two universities in South Africa that offer a genetic counseling degree. How competitive is it to be admitted to these programs? Because I know in the U.S. and Canada, it is quite competitive. Um, can you share what that's like and what the process of applying was for you, Sam? Yeah, it's pretty competitive. <laughs> um, so I applied and got in on my second round of applications. So I had, I know the, the struggling defeats that people I know often in America especially go through and like, can relate to. Um, but the process of applying is so this that's in Johannesburg and UCT both have kind of a extended process of applying. So you do a couple of rounds. So it will first be based on your marks and then they'll have a look at, you know, maybe your motivations, writing letters, you can do video entries of like this is who I am, this is why I want to do this. And then you'll get down to interviews. The interviews are different at each place. Like this is interviews about two days. So it's quite an extensive interview process and like getting to know the team and other people applying as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty competitive. I think there's about 40-ish people applying every year. Um, but UCT will take about two to four students every year and then this will take about two to four students every second year. So it's also a limited group. Maybe. That is very limited compared to, you know, other areas of the country. I, that makes sense how competitive it is. Um, once it comes for you, because you're second year now, is that correct? Yeah. So when it comes time to be, you know, graduating semi soon and, you know, looking at jobs, what are the job requirements of being a genetic counselor in South Africa? Obviously, you're set up very well to be graduating from a program, but do people need to graduate from a program? Or can you have other adjacent careers like a, or uh, degrees, like, say, nursing and, and kind of learning genetics on the job? Like, is that different from the United States where you need to graduate from a genetics program? So you do need to graduate from like, a genetic counseling degree. Um, Generally, you can have maybe you did like nursing previously and then you did the degree and then you can qualify. Um, but we also have our um, South African Health Council registration that you have to do. So you do the degree and you have to do two years of internship as well um, at like one of the main hospitals. And, and that's um, after graduation, like post, you kind of do like two years of an internship? So you can either do it after you graduate or you can start it in your second year. So I'm doing my second year of my degree and I'm doing my first year of internship both this year. So then hopefully at the end of next year, 2024, I'll be fully qualified. Wow. So that's very different. In the United States, like we 
just graduate from programs and are applying and then going straight into the job. So that's that's like a different setup. That's almost kind of more like um, doctors having like a residency period of, of being full time as an intern. Um, so when it comes to that, how competitive is it then to get a job? So you're competing with, you know, not, you know what? There's two to four students at both of the programs. So there's not a ton of people that are graduating, but how many job openings are there typically just looking at how limited the field is? <laughs> a lot less than we'd want them to be. Yeah, um, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, getting, so for the internship can also be paid or unpaid, depending on what becomes available and what funding is available. And then in terms of a job afterwards, it really, can change, but it is very limited, especially in states. It will be few and far between. Maybe if you work with a research project, then you can get a job through that. Um, but otherwise, a lot of um, GCs will go into private and either hire work for um, like a company or a lab, or they start their own kind of practice. That makes sense, especially looking at wait lists, like the demand is there. So to start your own private practice, um, I imagine that's hard straight after graduation of, of not having a ton of experience, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the yes. demand is, is certainly there. Do most genetic counselors that are working in South Africa graduate from one of these two programs? Or do you have a lot of people that are studying in other areas of the world and then relocating to South Africa? Like, you know, what does the community look like there? We are mostly South Africans, I think all South Africans basically, especially because it's not so easy to register without health council if you're international. Um, and there are limited jobs, so you're less likely to come here where you aren't guaranteed job security, whereas you know, if you've studied somewhere else, maybe you'll get a job more likely there. Um, but we actually have more, I guess, the other way going around, where we have GCs that qualify here, and a lot of them can also go and work in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, I think there's some place that they also come to. So we have also a lot of trained GCs leaving to find jobs elsewhere because I think it's like, yeah. Yeah, that, ma that makes sense. Yeah, well, wow, very interesting. And, and so on top of the internship that you have, you have the two years of school, two years of internship, which for you are overlapping by a year. Is there also a boards exam that you have to take or something to show that, okay, I am competent in this, I know enough of the information, or is your internship kind of replacing that in the sense of like, okay, I've been in the field for a little bit? Well, in your internship, you'll have um, like examinations within that. So your internship, you'll submit a full portfolio, which is including a lot of like how many patients you've seen, what conditions you've seen, and you'll also have like a practical exam that will be examined and you'll have a written exam. So it's kind of like a board exam, except it all falls within the internship. So it would be the specific internship site, like coming up with the exam. It's not necessarily like a um, South African, here is the one exam that you have. It's, it's more site dependent. Yes, exactly. So because of the HBCSA regulations, what they require before you can register as an independent practice GC, you have to submit that portfolio of evidence, which then gets assessed by two assessors, and there's a moderator as well. So those regulations, we're trying to think, well, do we really need three people? You just need an assessor and a moderator, basically. Um, but we don't have a national exam, like a board exam, like you have in the US. You, you, you trust that. So the training is regulated. So there are training guidelines. So the two programs have the same competencies that needs to be reached, very similar assessments. The portfolio is very standardized. So once the, the, the program, the intern training program has assessed the student to be competent to submit their portfolio, it's kind of like a board exam, but not really. It's not I see. structured, yeah. And it makes sense because you have 
less people compared to the U.S., so you're able to look at case by case and go through and, like, approval process. You can spend more time. Yeah. I I imagine, I don't know, maybe I'll get a little hate for this from, from the United States student counselors, but <laughs> it's probably a little bit more indicative of, okay, are you a proficient genetic counselor? Because you're looking at more of a full picture compared to, did you pass one exam? Um, so, you know, that kind of makes sense. I, I wish we could do something like that because some people are just not good exam takers and they're fantastic genetic counselors. So that, that makes sense. And, and what a, what a great system so that you can really show, okay, yes, you, you qualify for being a genetic counselor and, and we feel that you are going to provide adequate care to patients. We're looking forward to celebrating Rare Disease Awareness Month this February on DNA Today. Our first episode will be about Wilson's disease. The CEO of Orphanland joins the show to provide a major update on treatment for those with the condition, a new FDA-approved drug. Mark your calendars for February 3rd. That's when this episode about Wilson's disease will drop. It'll be episode 222. Get a head start on learning at Orphanland.com. Again, that's O-R-P-H-A-L-A-N.com. If you've been listening to DNA Today for a while, you probably know I'm also a full-time prenatal genetic counselor. Between that job, this podcast, and being a producer host of other podcasts, I'm pretty busy. So to keep up my energy and stay productive, I drink a decent amount of coffee. Think like Lorelai Gilmore, but maybe not quite that much. The new coffee I'm drinking is from Four Sigmatic, and I'm really picky about my coffee. It's got to be bold, not watery. That is the worst. I still drink it if I have to, but it's not my favorite. And I have to say, I've been really happy with Four Sigmatic. Here's the difference from other coffees. It includes mushrooms, which I know sounds bizarre. I will admit I was hesitant, but you don't taste the mushroom at all and you get the health benefits from it. I like the immune system boost as I often get sick in the winter months. So this is really important. And I wanted to team up with Four Sigmatic to get you 30% off using promo code DNA today. And you can redeem it at foursigmatic.com. Again, that's four, spell it out, F-O-U-R, Sigmatic, S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com. Use code DNA today for 30% off. And let me know if you like it too. Non-invasive prenatal testing screening has been around for a decade now, as long as DNA today. And the technology has evolved in those 10 years. The screening started to detect Down syndrome, and now Billion to One's Unity screen assesses for the chance for pregnancies to have aneuploidies, which are extra missing chromosome conditions, recessive conditions like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell, and the presence of red blood cell fetal antigens. Billion to One named the screening Unity Screen as it brings together fetal screening for aneuploidies and recessive conditions. And it represents uniting pregnant patients in more equitable care. Unity does not require a blood sample from the other biological parent or sperm donor to assess fetal risk. This enables more pregnancies at risk to be affected with recessive conditions to be identified early in pregnancy as compared to traditional carrier screening. Billion to One is working towards one goal, to detect disease one molecule at a time. No early with one simple blood test. Visit unityscreen.com for more information. And stay tuned for our upcoming episodes with Billion to One, exploring non-invasive prenatal screening for recessive conditions and red blood cell fetal antigens. Um, so along those lines, I imagine there's no certification or licensure. It's more just, you know, your group saying, okay, we've reviewed your case, your application here, like you've been approved. Am I getting that right? So we do have um, certification, we call it registration. So the reason why you're submitting that portfolio is so that the Health Professions Council of South Africa can deem you competent to practice independently. So if you do not have a health healthcare professions registration number, you cannot practice at all. So it's legislated, so there's a scope of practice, there are regulations, um, that you need to meet before you can practice. So somebody who has a degree, who doesn't, who haven't done the internship, will not be able to practice in South Africa. So I, I think it's like the credentialing in the US. We just call it registration. I see, yeah, very similar. Yeah. And you have a specific, yeah. unique identifier number that allows you to do that. Yes. Um, okay, so it's kind of similar to our NPI number mm. there. Um, yeah. So. When it comes to ordering genetic testing, then, this is something that really differs in the United States. 
for states that have licensure, those genetic counselors like myself, I can order my own genetic testing. I'm not ordering under a doctor's name. I'm just ordering it cured to need. Um, so when it comes to ordering testing, how do you guys fall? Do you have to order under a doctor or can you just order it under your own name? So that is a tricky one. We, we have to work, um, the doctors have to order. But it's uh, very interestingly written in our scope of practice. It says in consultation with. So we practice in consultation with. So it doesn't mean, you know, you could, that's open to interpretation, but we, we can't order genetic testing. So, we so you're really working do it under a doctor. Yeah. I see the partnership there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. And and when you do get genetic testing, you know, results back, what is the flow there in terms of actually even backing up a little bit to when you're meeting with a patient? How involved are other healthcare providers like nurse practitioners, doctors? Are you very independent in terms of patient comes in, you meet with them, you talk about the testing that's being ordered? Or is a doctor also involved in that same visit? I, I mean, it also probably depends on what type of appointment. I'm sure pediatrics mm. is a little different than prenatal. Mm. Um, so, for example, the breast cancers. Although we write the doctor's number on the form, we make the decision as to whether this person should be tested, what sort of test should be ordered. We get the results back and we deliver them. So we work independently. If anything, we work more with the oncologists than with our medical geneticists. So that's the one area with the pediatric cases, that diagnosis, that would be a medical geneticist making the diagnosis, ordering tests. When the result is out, that would be handed over to us. And then the, the medical geneticist would put all the referrals in place and the further management. So that's very different. With the prenatals, we're also pretty independent. But again, the doctors, those can be very tricky, as you know. So there is sort of a consultation discussion with the medical geneticist before you go and see the case and then what tests should be ordered. And, you know, then you go ahead and order that. But like the NIPTs, we don't need the clinicians. It's when there are fetal anomalies that you really have to have a, a Clo a good discussion between the fetal medicine specialist and our clinicians and them. So in some senses, we're completely independent. We write a name on the form. <laughs> and in some senses, we're there to give the results and some we kind of in the middle. So it's a bit of a mix. Yeah, so really team approach when it comes to mm -hmm. that, to mm -hmm. figure out, okay, how can we give the best care to this patient and who's taking what roles, which, which makes sense. And and I know cost is always an issue. Um, you know, I'm sure that's kind of universal. Who typically pays for the actual genetic counseling consults? Is that something that insurance typically covers? Or is that something where, you know, state kind of covers that? Or is it a lot of self-pay? I mean, I imagine in the, in the private sector, it's a lot of self-pay. Mm. Um, so we have very different systems. In state, it is covered within the hospital system. So a patient would come in, be seen, whether it's oncology or genetics or the prenatal or the test, that patient will get a bill from the hospital. So it's not individually paid. Um, in private, it works different. So the patients will have medical aids, as we call them, uh, medical insurance, I think, in America. So they belong to the scheme, they pay a monthly premium um, and when they order tests. So there are arrangements between the, the insurer and the service provider. So as genetic counselors, we do have um, codes and a cost associated with the, with the consult. Um, and then you have to also be very careful which laboratory you use become, because the laboratory might not have an agreement with the counselor and with the laboratory, and then that would make it difficult for the patients to get reimbursed. Um, and then we order a lot of overseas testing, and our medical aid does not cover that. There's very limited coverage of any international testing. But yeah, so it's patient pay, as we would call it, um, and then through their medical aids that they are able to be reimbursed. 
So pretty so, similar to what we are mm-hmm. here, except for mm-hmm. I've never ordered a test, at least not yet. You know, check back with me in a few years when I have more experience. But I've never ordered an international genetic test. So most of the testing you order, you say, are, you know, more local to you. And is that private companies? Is there any, like, state-run genetic labs? Like, what, what is the industry like? Sam, do you want to comment? Um, we do have state-run labs that we work with and send testing that we do. So, for example, we have, like, our breast cancer, we have a 50 gene panel. So that's an option that we use for a lot of our state patients because that can be covered by you know, hospital fees and things like that. Um, but then, as he said, we also do use the international Whereas um, we were using like a lot of Mbite, especially if patients had more um, finances to pay for a genetic test and they wanted maybe a bigger panel or something like that. Mbite obviously can do bigger ones than like a 50 inch in for breast cancer. So, so we do definitely have some in state testing, but um, it's limited. That makes sense. And then that. As you said, cost plays a big role, unfortunately, in this. So we we have that aspect in common. I think everybody in the world that's you know working with patients and trying to figure that aspect out. Um, one of my other questions is looking at patient advocacy organizations. Is that something that you guys are working directly with certain organizations? Um, I don't know if there's like local organizations or it's more international organizations that you're working with. I imagine if you are, you might be getting referrals from them. Um, what are those relationships like? We definitely work with uh, those patient advocacy groups and things like that. We do have local ones. So like a big one, Cancer you know, Rare Diseases, and they basically cover many, many different conditions and try connect different people and create support groups. They have recently employed their own genetic counselor, so they also have someone that's in their team. Um, and we also work, when we deal with um, data drug counseling and counseling, we um, work with a group that's based in one of our main hospitals um, called Toy Library. And also, all the students will kind of be involved in some support groups and um, kind of linking patients. But yeah, we are quite involved in trying to do that. Yeah, that's fantastic, especially as a student to start gaining that experience of learning from patient advocates and what that lived experience is because. You know, as, as much as we study, unless we have that genetic condition, we can only understand so much, you know, kind of from my perspective there and everything. Um, you know, as we... Oh, go ahead, Sam. No, I was just going to agree. It's it's one thing to study it, but it's different things a little bit. And I think there's a lot of value in learning from the patients and their experiences. And everyone is different. And I think it's good to kind of be aware of that. Yeah, it is. and And I like the shift that I've seen over the years of having more focus on patient advocates and seeing them as experts, because, you know, certainly on this show, we learn so much from patient advocates. I think those are some of our best interviews here. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, definitely look to patient advocates to be educating myself and everybody. So how do you guys see the field changing in, let's say the next five years? Um, you know, it's been about six years since I checked in, as I mentioned that I talked to Shelly. Uh, which I imagine it's such a small community, you probably know her. Um, but how how do you see things changing in the next couple of years? I mean, Sam, as you're starting out your career here, um, you know, what what do you expect to see change? Well, or what do you right. hope to change? We could also, sh- you, we could shift it that way. <laughs> I'm hoping for growth and for more positions. And I think, um, you know, even within our little team of interns and students, I know everyone has like big hopes and big plans and wanting to expand, you know, genetic counseling across the country and, you know, maybe create um, genetic counseling programs at different universities as well so that, you know, we can actually start spreading it more and more. So I think that's one of the ways that I'm hoping that we'll see it grow. Um, yeah, 
or if Tina has anything else that she wants to add. <laughs> um, I I agree. I think that one of the thing is things that have changed is that we have critical mass now. We have a lot more counselors. We trained one or two a year. Um, people left. There was a, there was a stage um, when we kind knew the programs took new students, so there was a bit of a sort of a, la a a gap. And we're definitely training more and more and more. So we have a lot more people, more students, younger people with lots of ideas. And I think things are moving. If I think about last year, the last two years, we have more counselors employed like this example of rare diseases that we've got a counselor employed there we have another laboratory employed a counselor so they and another laboratory has employed another one or two so there's there's a lot of growth and i think we kind of at the the beginning and that I, i'm hoping and projecting it, putting it out there in the universe that you know there might be exponential growth and I think if we could get into this community service sort of idea that if government buys into that that we could then you know bring more services even if it's just for one year in the in the state hospitals and the idea is that from there that hopefully they will see the value and posts could be created um, so I think, I think it is looking up, <laughs> if I can be oh, positive. That's very encouraging. <laughs> and I also think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of research in, in Africa mm -hmm. on African genomes and personalized medicine. And we all know that the African genome is underrepresented in the reference sequence. So with those projects, there are lots of other specialists getting involved in research and realizing more and more that we need genetic counselors. So I think there will be more posts or more, even if it's a contract, sort of contract basis that they will employ counselors on their research projects. So it's kind of sort of little bits here and there. And, and I suppose the, we'll only know in the future. We must interview us in six years time. And see yes, that sounds good. Let's put it on the books now. So it happened. But yeah, I think that's also a really good point with the African genome of, of just being able to. We did a really interesting episode. I wish I remembered the number. It's in the show notes. Um, but looking at how valuable that information is, and that, you know, as you said, I've, I've said it, if people listen to this, they're like, here, I talked about this way too much, but I can't talk about it enough that it is underrepresented. Um, and it's a lot of European genomes. Um, that are really making up these databases and, and, and we're shifting, I think, but you know, not fast enough from my perspective, but yeah, that's a really good point. I can see, you know, more initiatives and, um, you know, specific groups of researchers coming together and many of them being genetic counselors. Um, so that's certainly something to keep our eye on there, but yes, we'll definitely have you guys back on, see what's changed, um, see how Sam is adjusting to, you know, her upcoming new role and everything, but Thank you so much for coming on. It's just so interesting. I love interviews like this where talk with someone, you know, like I don't even know how many miles away we are, but, you know, many, many miles. Um, and just being able to know about like how genetic counseling is different from, you know, here in North America. It's just so interesting to me. So thank you both for coming on and just being so eager to share all this with us. I just love me being great. on. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com, where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kier Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.